the Victoria Police Force presents D-24. From the files of the Victoria Police, for the first time come these true stories of unceasing war against crime, of day and night vigilance that protect our life and our property, and of the nerve center of the Police Information Bureau, D-24. This is the true story of the shotgun pattern. This is a true story from the files of the Victoria Police. Only names, place names and dates have been altered. On a small farm about a hundred miles from Melbourne, Alexander Breen lived with his wife Marjorie. They were a middle-aged couple who had worked hard to bring up their two children to save something for a rainy day. It was just a few years ago that the Breens hit the headlines because of a sensational and near tragic event that shocked the entire district where they were so well known and respected. To fully understand all that happened, we go back several years. At about three o'clock one Tuesday afternoon, Mrs. Breen was busy in her kitchen when her husband suddenly appeared at the door. Alec, whatever are you doing here? I thought you were down working in the back paddock. So I was, but I finished. Oh, but you can't be finished. Only this morning you said it would take you a week to do all you had to do. I can't help that. I'm not doing any more. What's wrong, dear? Don't you feel well? No, I don't. Oh, sit down. I'll make you a nice hot cup of tea. Ah, I'm done in, really, I am. We'll soon fix you. No. No, you won't. But of course I will, Alec. No. All you'll do is fix me up so I can go back and work myself to a frazzle again. Alec! For 15 years now, I've worked from morning till night so that we could own this farm. Now we do own it, and what's the result? I've still got to work my inside out so we can make ends meet. No, it's not worth it, I tell you. I've done my share of the work too, dear. Yes, I know. Where's it got you? We've got a roof over our heads. We've always been able to feed and clothe the children as well as ourselves. And we don't owe a penny to anyone. But we're not getting any further forward. Oh, Alec, of course we are. You just said we own our own farm now. Well, we're going to sell it. Sell it? Sell it, and quickly, before it kills the both of us. Oh, I'm sure you can't mean it, Alec. I never meant anything more in my life. I'm going to get a job in the town, a nine-to-five job. A job that doesn't depend on droughts or floods or bushfires or crop failures. Oh. A job where I can have a bit of time to myself now and again. But, Alec, I, I love this place. I've helped to build it. I... I couldn't leave it. You don't have to leave it. But only a minute ago you said you were going to sell it. So I am, but that doesn't mean we leave it. I do wish I could understand what you're driving at. I've worked it all out. You know Arthur Hurst? Yes, dear. Uh, he's always looking for some sort of an investment. He's got tons of cash and doesn't like work very much. Now, my idea is this. We sell out to him, then rent the farmhouse back. Rent it back? Yes. He can work the farm itself with a couple of his men if he wants to, but he won't need the house, so we'll rent it from him. Do you think he'd agree to an arrangement like that? Well, we'll soon know. You've asked him? Not yet, but if you'll just stop talking and make me that cup of tea, I'll ride around to his place and sound him out. So the Breens sold their farm and rented it back. It was some little time before Marjorie Breen became reconciled to the idea. But eventually, when her husband seemed to be happy in his new job, was obviously in better health, she accepted the inevitable. 
One of her main interests outside her home and family was her local church. Not only did she attend the Sunday services regularly, but she was an enthusiastic worker on several church committees. And it was to a meeting of one of these that she was going one Friday night. Oh, Andy, don't dawdle so with your meal. You know I'm in a hurry. Oh, sorry, Mum. I was thinking. Thinking of that young man you're going to the dance with tonight, I suppose. Gosh, how did you get? <laughs> it was written all over your face. I hope you don't look like that when you're with him. What was I looking like? A lovesick calf. Oh, Daddy. Oh, leave the child alone, Dad. That's all very well. Anne's far too young to be getting serious about any man. I'm 17. I seem to remember your being interested in me when I was only 17, Alec. That's different. Perhaps you think that was a mistake now. I didn't say that. Not in so many words. But sometimes I wonder if you don't occasionally think you're sorry we're married. Don't be ridiculous. Oh, Mummy, Daddy, please don't quarrel. We're not quarreling. Just that now and again it's a good idea to face up to facts. Oh. Isn't it about time you are leaving for your meeting? Yes, come on, Mummy. I'll do the washing up. You go and get ready. Everyone seems very anxious to get me out of the house all of a sudden. You're determined to make trouble tonight, aren't you, Marjorie? Not at all. Well, then just do as Anne says and go and get ready. You too, Anne. I don't like your mother going into town on her own. You get ready too and go as far as they're with her. Leave the washing up to me. You're sure it's no trouble? Quite sure, so run along, both of you. I'll fix the dishes, read a book for half an hour, and then go to bed. It's a pity you don't take a little more interest in the church. What? You mean go and sit around with all those chattering magpies of women? <laughs> no, thanks. I'd rather go to the dance with Anne. I've never seen you dancing, Daddy. And I shouldn't think you ever will. Oh, I'm tired. And I'm tired because I tried to provide something for your mother and you children. And as soon as you got it, you sold it. You know perfectly well why I sold the farm. I... No, oh, I don't think there's much point in going on with this discussion. Off you go, both of you. I'll see you when you come back. Yes, it seems that nerves are on edge in the Breen household on that fateful Friday night. And the greeting that awaited Mrs. Breen when she arrived at Mrs. Burke's home for the church meeting wasn't calculated to calm her down. Ah, it's Mrs. Breen. Oh, goodness me. Didn't you get the message? What message? About the meeting. It's been postponed. No. Yes, it has. Poor Mr. Robinson has a frightful cold. We just couldn't have a meeting without Mr. Robinson, could we now? No, I suppose not. Oh, I do wish someone had taken the trouble to let me know. I have a long way to come, and I shouldn't be surprised if there's a thunderstorm before I get home. Oh, my dear, I'm so sorry. I was sure I'd notified everyone. Sure of it. Oh, dear. Sometimes I think I should never have been made secretary. I do such silly things at times. Oh, well, can't be helped. Well, now I'd better be on my way home. Oh, but you can't do that, Mrs. Breen. After coming all this way, you simply must come in and have a chat. Oh, no, no, it, it's quite all right. I insist that you come in. But I'd like to avoid the thunderstorm. Don't you worry about that. When we've had a good long talk and some supper, I'll drive you home myself, right to your door. So Mrs. Breen and Mrs. Burke talked until midnight. And then, with the thunderstorm just starting to break, the kindly Mrs. Burke got out her car and drove Mrs. Breen homewards. I'm so glad we had that little talk. Oh, it's a long time since I enjoyed an evening so much. You're very kind. But what else could I do? After all, it's my fault you came all that way. And on such a dreadful night, too. Oh, it was worth every minute of it. Although I don't know what my husband will say at my coming home at this time of night. Oh, he doesn't approve of your being out so late. It's not that. It's just that the church meetings always finish so much earlier. He'll wonder what on earth's happened to me. Oh, well, as long as you turn up safe and sound in the end. Now, there's our gate, just ahead. The white one? Yes. Just drop me there and I can walk the rest. Certainly not. I said I'd drive you right to your door, and so I will. No, 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 you mustn't. The drive's in an awful condition. And I'll be quite all right, really, I will. It's only a few hundred yards. You're quite sure? With all this thunder and lightning. I'm used to it. Besides, I have my torch. And it's not raining yet. So thank you all the same, but I'll just get out here. 
do hope you'll come and visit us soon. Oh, I'd love to. What about next Friday? Next Friday? Yes, yes, I think I could manage that. Then it's fixed. We look forward to seeing you about eight. Good night. Thank you again. It was a great pleasure. Good night, my dear. What a very nice woman she is. Goodness me, that gate's getting very stiff. I must tell Alec to do something about it in the morning. What am I talking about? In the morning. It's morning now. Oh, dear. I'll be so sorry when I have to get... <gasps> What's that? I'm sure I... I heard something move. Who's there? Who's there? Whoever it is, come out! Was Mrs. Breen's imagination playing tricks? Or was someone lying in wait for her? In a few moments, we'll continue this true story from the files of the Victoria Police. Yes, dear. What time is it? Just after nine, dear. I've been asleep. Yes? As soon as I put you on the bed last night, you went straight off. Oh, my face. It's so terribly sore. And... Alec. What is it, dear? My eye. My left eye. I can't see with it. It's been badly hurt, Marjorie, but it'll get better. I bathed your face as best I could last night, and... Oh, you're good to me, Alec. Nonsense, dear. Don't you think we ought to get a doctor? Yes, perhaps we should. I'm so frightened about my eye. I can't see. Try not to worry, dear. You just take it easy while I go and ring Dr. Foster. <laughs> Come at last, Doctor. I came as quickly as I possibly could, Mr. Breen. Uh, you know Constable Richards, I think. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Morning, Constable. Morning, Mr. Breen. Very sorry to hear about your wife. I thought it advisable to bring the Constable with me in view of what you said about your wife being shot. Shh, not so loud. My wife doesn't know she was shot. She doesn't? No, she thinks she was struck by lightning. Oh. I knew as soon as I saw her that the marks on her face were made by shotgun pellets. But I thought he'd better not to shock her by telling her. Uh, don't you think you should have rung me as soon as it happened? I was going to, but she seemed to be sleeping so quietly I didn't want to disturb her. Hmm. Oh, well, I'd better go into her. You know the bedroom, don't you? Yes, thank you. Uh, you don't want to come in right away, I suppose, Constable? Oh, no, no. I'll have to talk to Mr. Breen here. Oh, right. Uh, I shouldn't be very long. It's a... Bad business, isn't it? You've no idea how it happened. None at all. I was in bed, wondering what had kept her out so late, as a matter of fact, when I heard her calling me outside the bedroom window. What time was this? Oh, it must have been nearly one o'clock. Of course, I got her into bed as quickly as possible and then bathed her face and went to bed myself. Do you know anyone who'd want to shoot your wife? No, I certainly do not. The whole thing's got me tricked. The shooting actually happened in your drive. Well, she told me that what happened to her happened there, yes. I'd been too worried to go out and check for myself. But you weren't worried enough to phone the doctor last night. I should have, I know, but I was too upset to realize what I was doing. You'd get a bit of a shock, you know, if your wife suddenly appeared at the door in that state. Yes, I certainly would. Uh, Mr. Breen. Yes, Doctor. I want to use your phone. We must bring an ambulance. Is she that bad? Uh, she's in a very serious condition and must go into hospital immediately. Doctor, I... There's no time for discussion, Mr. Breen. Please show me your telephone. Yes, yes, of course. This way, please, Doctor. Here you are, Doctor. Thank you. I'll wait for you in the front room. 
This is even worse than I thought, Constable. It doesn't look good. I'm sorry to have to worry you, but if we're to track down the person responsible, we'll have to get moving. What do you want me to do? Well, first of all, let's see if we can find where the shooting actually occurred. There was no difficulty about that at all. For a telltale trail of red led right to the spot where Mrs. Breen had fallen to the ground. Here, the constable found some pellets from a shotgun, a cartridge wad, and some small pieces of glass that almost certainly came from Mrs. Breen's spectacles. After carefully marking the exact spot, the policeman went back to the house, obtained what little information Mrs. Breen could give him, and then called in the homicide squad from Melbourne. Detectives and scientific experts hurried to the scene of the shooting. That's the spot, just there, Sergeant. See, there are still a few pieces of glass from her spectacles there. Hmm. And you say that the main force of the pellet struck her on the left side of the head? That's right. Then whoever did it would most likely have been standing somewhere in that long grass over there. I suppose he would. Let's have a look. Have a look at that. What? See where someone has completely flattened the grass? So they have. Rather peculiar, those marks, aren't they? Ah. Yes, I think that would be it. I'd say someone waited here for her for quite a long time. Yes? And I'd say that while he was here, he was kneeling. See those two indentations nearer the drive? Yes. The sort of marks a man would make of these knees, don't you think? Could be. And about 15 inches behind them, two much more pronounced marks. Yes. Those be caused by the toes of his boots. And judging by their depth, I think our man was pretty nervous while he was waiting. And fidgeted round a good deal. Bill? Yes? Bill, uh, just stand in the spot where Mrs. Breen fell, will you? Right. Then we can get an idea of how well the gunman could see her. This is it. Good. Just stay there a minute. Now we kneel down like this. Yes, that'll be fine. If I had a gun, I could pick Bill off in a second. All right, Bill, that'll do. Okay. Well, we've learned something, haven't we? Now, let's see if we can find where the man went after the shooting. Ah, uh -uh, there he goes. Hey, I mean, there are some footprints that could easily be his. Let's follow them. Ah, oh, now they've stopped. Bad luck. Yes, we were going well. But from here on, there doesn't seem to be a sign of them. But there is one thing about them. Oh, uh, what? The direction in which they've been leading us. Look straight ahead. The house? Yes, the Bean's own home. We'll go and have a look round in there. Do you own a shotgun, Mr. Breen? Yes, I do. Could we see it for a minute? You don't think I shot my wife, do you? Oh, we don't know who shot her. But just let's see your gun. Oh, and any cartridges you might have, too. Huh. You're welcome. What sort of fellow is this, Breen? Always seemed all right to me. Been here a long time, hasn't he? Oh, yes, years. Here you are. Not that they'll help you much. The gun. Thanks. And a box of assorted cartridges. I'll take those. We won't keep them longer than we have to, Mr. Breen. Keep them as long as you like. I hardly ever use them these days. Oh, and by the way, that's a nasty tear in the sleeve of your coat there. Eh? Look, just above the elbow. A piece ripped right out. Huh. So there is. Hey, didn't you know about it? No. Oh. No, I didn't. I'll have to get my daughter to mend it. Yes. Yes, you will. All right. We'll be back later.
detective discovered that although the shotgun was clean, there was a distinct smell of powder in the breech, which suggested that it had been fired quite recently. And so he arranged with the ballistics expert for a test. You're using the same sort of shot as was fired at Mrs. Breen, Mac? Yes, number three shot and a cartridge from Breen's books. And you're going to fire it at exactly the same distance as the shot was fired last night? Aye, I've measured it carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, those pieces of white cardboard I've set up over there, they represent Mrs. Breen. Uh -huh. Now, I get down here, like this, uh -huh. into the kneeling position the man was probably in. Yes. Now we'll fire and see what happens. How did I go? You smacked that cardboard right in the middle. All right. Now we'll go and have a look at it. Now, just a minute. What's up? Come over here a second. What about our bit of cardboard? Now, that can wait. Come over here. See? On that barbed wire fence. A bit of cloth. What do you think it is? Unless I'm very much mistaken, it's the missing piece of Farmer Breen's coat. Well, that doesn't prove much. Could have been there for ages. I don't think so. We didn't even know it was missing till I pointed it out this afternoon. We'll just take this with us. There. Now, let's look at your marksmanship. Pretty good shooting, eh? <laughs> Not bad. Now, tell me what it proves. Well, no. There are 172 pellets of number three shot in a cartridge. Yeah. And when the pellets leave the barrel of the gun, they start to spread out. The further they go, the wider they spread. Of course. Now, no two guns are exactly the same. But if you fire the one gun at a target, say, 30 feet away, providing you use the same size shot and cartridge, the same pattern should appear on the target every time you fire. Mm -hmm. In other words, if this gun was used to shoot Mrs. Breen, the pattern the pellets made on her face should be almost identical with the pattern on this piece of white cardboard as regards to grouping of pellets. I see. If, however, a different gun was used to shoot Mrs. Breen, the pattern on her face could be very different. Because, as I said, every gun fires its pellets slightly differently. So the spread is different when they reach the target. So now, it's up to us to have a close look at the pattern on Mrs. Breen's face. The rest was comparatively easy. The pattern of pellets on Mrs. Breen's face was remarkably similar to that on the piece of white cardboard. And the ballistics expert assured the detectives that it was very probable that Mr. Breen's gun had done the damage. Confronted with this, the small piece of cloth from his coat that had been caught on a barbed wire fence so near to the scene of the shooting, Alec Breen eventually broke down and confessed that he had indeed shot his wife. After she went out, I was brooding over my troubles. I thought I'd stop her nagging at me for good. So I planned it out that I'd shoot her. And no one could catch me for it. Yes? I saw my wife get out of the car and come up the drive with a torch. When she was about ten yards away, I gave her the full charge. She fell down and I ran through the paddocks. When I got back to the house, I cleaned the gun and then went inside. A bit later on, I heard her call out to me. So I went out and carried her in. I was a fool to think I could have got away with it. But now that I haven't, I'll put up with the consequences. Mrs. Breen lived, but lost the sight of her left eye. And her husband went to jail for, as the trial judge said, the spoiling of a woman's face and the ignominy he'd thrust on his children, which will be their cross forever. And so we close with our usual reminder to everyone everywhere to always cooperate with our police force wherever and whenever possible. 
Only names, place names and dates were altered in this true story. It was dramatized from the files of the Victoria Police by Roland Strong, who now says goodbye until the same time next week, when there'll be another true story in this series, D-24, which is brought to you by the Victoria Police Force and produced in the studios of Hector Crawford Productions by Dorothy Crawford. Thank you.